All right, I'm pretty tired tonight, so I only might I might only go an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, as Lisa says, the word of God fires me up, so I, I'll be fine. What we've been doing is uh, last couple months going through passages that people use to say that we can lose our salvation. <coughs> so conditional salvation verses. And especially the last, I don't know, five weeks or so, we've been going over uh, verses specifically in Paul's epistles. As we mentioned, that uh, you can find passages when it comes to Israel's program where they can lose their salvation because they're justified by faith plus works of faith. So if they take the mark of the beast or bow down to the image of the beast in the last half of the tribulation, they lose their salvation. If they don't forgive others, if they deny Christ... Um, by taking the mark or worshiping the image, then they lose their salvation. But uh, for us in the dispensation of grace, Romans 5, and that's, if you remember, it's been a while, but uh, originally started going through the doctrines that are found in Paul's epistles. And we're going to take them in order, starting in Romans. Well, Romans 5, we, we learned about our eternal security. We learned from verse 9 that we are now justified by His blood, we learned from verse 11 that we have now received the atonement. And so I wanted to take a, you know, a little detour and talk about these uh, supposed verses where you can lose your salvation to show that you are eternally secure, that these verses in Paul's epistles are not teaching you can lose your salvation. And so then we've got, I picked 18 verses in Paul's epistles. We've covered 16 of them, so we have two left. And I anticipate we'll finish those two before our hour is over tonight. And then we'll, um, next time we'll start into uh, Romans chapter 6. Uh, Romans 6 through 8, who we are in Christ. Uh, the most important thing to understand for anybody is how you're saved. That you recognize your sin, you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. You'll learn that in Romans 1 through 3. Then the next thing to, to learn is your eternal security so that you're not worried about losing your salvation. It takes the focus off of you and it puts it on Christ. And we learn that in Romans 4 through 5. So then once you learn eternal security, then you get to Romans 6 through 8 and you learn of who you are in Christ and how Christ can live in you and how you don't have to obey the lust of the flesh, but you can walk in the Spirit. That's Romans 6 through 8. So, uh, But you got to have that foundation it's a sad thing, I think at least, and I hate to throw percentages out, but I'd say at least 90% of the people who go to churches aren't really saved because they've never trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sin. They, they've added stuff. Maybe make Jesus the Lord of your life or uh, say the sinner's prayer or um, get water baptized or turn from your sins uh, you know, or make sure you confess your sins. they got all these different things that they'll add to it. Well, of the people who actually hear a clear gospel and believe it, uh, very few, probably uh, less than 10% of those, understand their eternal security. And out of those, probably another 10% or, or less understand Romans 6 through 8. So it's, uh, you know, with the, uh, I think I've heard uh, Richard Jordan say the largest denomination of churches, uh, largest denomination in Christianity is the ignorant brethren. Because that's what you've got. A lot of people who are ignorant, they don't even understand... And once you get through Romans 8, all you've really got is the foundational doctrine. We haven't got, that's just the foundational doctrine of faith. You haven't understand dispensationalism yet, that's Romans 9 through 11. You haven't understand the practical aspects of, of your walk in Romans 12 through 16. You don't know about the love of God over there in Ephesians. You don't have the hope of the rapture, First and Second Thessalonians. And so you're looking at at least 99, probably over 99% of the people who attend churches. Um, don't know Romans 1 through 8 doctrine, don't know all of that. And if you don't have that, you can't really have Christ live in you if you don't know what it's all about. Uh, when we get to what we have in Christ, you know, for example, we're spiritually circumcised. The body of the sins of the flesh have been cut off from our soul. I would not know that unless I read it in Paul's epistles. I've been spiritually baptized into Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. I wouldn't know that unless I read Paul's epistles. I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until and unto the day of redemption. I wouldn't know that unless I read it in Paul's epistles. But yet people don't even get past Romans 8 and their doctrine, and so they don't know these things. 
so that's why we spent so much time on the conditional salvation verses and going over those because once you understand that you're eternally secure in Christ, then you don't have to worry about that stuff and you can move on and get the Romans 6 through 8 doctrine. That's where Christ is living in you. Um, God did not just send his son to save you from hell. That was a very important thing, but it was only a first step. He saved you so that he could have his son live in you, living by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God for you in Paul's epistles in all eternity. And if you don't understand those first five chapters of Romans, you never even get to that point. You're so busy about making sure you either earn your salvation or keep your salvation or show that you're really saved in the first place that you never have Christ live in you. So that's why we spent so much time on these verses. So we'll conclude tonight uh, because we just have two verses left uh, in Paul's epistles on conditional salvation. I've written the first one on the board here, the reference anyway. 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, verse 12, and also verse 15. 1 Timothy 5, verse 12, we'll go ahead and read that. It says, Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And then verse 15 says, For some are already turned aside after Satan. So, you know, it sounds like here, if you've got damnation, usually when you hear that term damnation, people think, uh, just like when you hear the term salvation, people automatically think saved from hell. But as we've seen in Paul's epistles, it can be saved, a lot of times it's saved from the course of this world, uh, saved from your own flesh. It, uh, salvation from hell has already been settled in Romans 3, and you learn you're eternally secure by the end of Romans 5, so Paul doesn't ever have to address salvation from hell again because you should already have that built up in your inner man, doctrinally speaking. And so when he talks about salvation after that, it's usually something else that you're saved from. Saved from hell, not saved from hell, but saved from uh, false doctrine, from the course of this world, from your flesh, from religion, uh, as we did in our uh, conference, what, a year and a half ago now, December 2021. Yes, 2021. <laughs> it's hard to keep track of these years. Um, and so, similarly, when people see damnation, like they see in 1 Timothy 5.12, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith, well, people automatically think, oh, well, that means they lost their salvation. And in fact, when you see in verse 15, some have already turned aside after Satan. Uh, so then they say, oh, see, you can lose your salvation. But that's, again, that's not what it's talking about. Uh, the context is having to do with widows. It's uh, in verse 3. It starts, the context starts in verse 3, 1 Timothy 5, verse 3. Honor widows that are widows indeed. Uh, the first thing to note here is the culture of that day is a little different than today. Uh, today, women can have careers and make money and take care of themselves. Um, the culture back then, it wasn't conducive to that. It was hard for women to make it on their own. So a woman has uh, a husband. She um, has a couple kids, let's say. That's the typical scenario here. And you got to be a, to be a widow. That means you had a husband and the husband died. So what are you going to do? You know, I had my wife died, so I'm a widower, but I can continue at my job. I was the one working outside of the home. I worked my job. Uh, my wife stayed at home, took care of the house. She didn't work outside the home. So for me, it's, well, she died. Well, I can still make a living. I can still go to my job. But for her, well, I was the one coming in the house with the money. So what is she going to do? Uh, now, she could go and probably get a job and, you know, work, um, you know, if, that, if I was to die before her. But in that culture there, in a lot of cultures and a lot of time, uh, there isn't that opportunity for that. And so then, in that case then, uh, Paul is given the criteria for the church to take care of these women who are widows. And uh, another thing to understand is this isn't the, uh, the Joel Osteen church where they've got millions and millions of dollars and all this wealth in there. Uh, you're talking about primarily churches or house churches, or if they do actually have a building, it's not going to be all that big. If you look at the Grace Churches today, Richard Jordan probably has the biggest right division church that I know of. What does he have, 100 people maybe on a Sunday morning? I don't know. Uh, again, it's not a mega church, you know. Our biggest right division church is small. So it's not like 
right division churches, Bible-believing churches are just sitting on a pile of money that they can give out to these widows to help them out. Um, you know, it's not going to be easy. So that's why you're given these criteria here. So Paul says, okay, Timothy, if you got widows, they can't take care of themselves because of the culture or whatever reason, then um, here are the qualifications to take a widow in. Uh, it says, um, first verse 4, verse 4 says, If any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. So in other words, if you got a widow who's a widow indeed, um, the default shouldn't be for the church to take care of them, because again, the, the church isn't sitting on a pile of money. We've learned that in our 2 Corinthians that we've been covering, the poor saints in Jerusalem and how Macedonia gave in a deep, uh, out of their deep poverty. Macedonia didn't have much money, but yet they, they, they sacrificed to help out the poor saints in Jerusalem. So when you've got a Bible-believing church like this, and you've got a widow that needs to be taken care of, it may not be easy. You know, they may have to make some sacrifices to be able to take care of this woman. So the thing is, first, um, their family. You know, she shouldn't just go to the church. It's not like they have a bunch of money. But look at the family. See if the family can help. But if for whatever reason um, she doesn't have anybody to take care of her, well then the church can take, take her in as a widow and take care of her. And notice for verse 9, here are the qualifications. 1 Timothy 5, 9. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man. So first off, if the widow is under 60 years old, she is not to be taken by care of by the church. She should uh, find her a husband and get married, is what it's saying. Um, but if she is at least 60 years old, then here are the qualifications. One, she has to have been the wife of one man, so she can't be, you know, be in being with all these other men, only be married once there. Verse 10, she needs to be well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have watched, washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So uh, she's got to be at least 60 years old and have these, all these qualifications. So then you say, well, why 60? How, how did you come up with that? Well, the, then that gives you the answer, verse 11. But the younger widows refuse. So maybe they need all these qualifications, but if they're under 60, he says, don't take care of them. They need to get married. Why? And this is the context of our so-called conditional salvation passage. It says in verse 11, But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. So what he's saying here is that if a woman is, if, if you've got this woman who is at least 60 years old, she meets all these qualifications, then you take her in as a widow, which means the church is going to support her. So the woman isn't going to be married to a man. It's as if she is just directly married to Christ. If Because the church is the body of Christ. And so if the church is going to take care of her, it's like if, if she's being taken care of, it's like she's being taken care of, uh, like she's been married to Christ. And again, they're not going to have much money. And if, so if she's 60 or over, and then the church takes care of her, again, they don't have much resources to do so. Well, now she needs to do her part to help out. And that's why you have those qualifications in verse 10. Because if she's well reported of her good works and brought up children, lodged strangers, washed the saints' feet, relieved the afflicted, she diligently followed every good work. Then what the church can do is take her in as a widow and take care of her in exchange. Now, she's not going to be working at a job. She's not going to be taking care of a husband. But it's like she's married to Christ because she's sort of married to the church. And so then she would do things that the church needs done. Maybe it means uh, cleaning the, you know, cleaning up bef after the service or before the service, or uh, you know, making sure, you know, cleaning the dishes or you know, washing pots or bringing in 
uh, food, cooking food, or uh, you know, just whatever it is she can do, whatever her talents are, because she's got the time, and she's not taking care of a family, she's just by herself. So now it says, it says if she's married to Christ and trying to take care of things at the church in exchange for the church taking care of her. And so what it's saying then, since that's the relationship, he says in verse 11, if you've got younger widows under 60 years old, refuse them because just the way, the, the way they are, um, you know, everybody knows that you have different stages of life. I mean, you live differently when you're a child as opposed to when you're a teenager, as opposed to when you're a young adult. And that stage in life of under 60 is, as an adult, under 60 is usually when you're married and taking care of a family. And then over 60, it is, well, you can, you can do without having a husband uh, because you feel like, well, you're beyond that age. You know, um, uh, a lot of times I think if someone uh, gets married and then the, the spouse dies uh, and they're over 60, they're probably really not interested in getting married again. They could, but they're not really interested so much. And so, but if they're under that age, uh, because just how our bodies are made and, it's, and they're in that stage of life, he says that they will have begun to wax wanton against Christ. They will marry. So if the, if say, say the woman is 50 years old and the church agrees to take care of her, well then she has basically married herself to Christ rather than having a husband. But then she's going to wax wanton against Christ because it's, it's different, you know, I understand you're, you're with Christ, but Christ isn't physically there. It's not a physical human being. Christ is, you know, there in spirit, and um, you're the body of Christ. So then it, say, it says, basically, if a woman is under 60, and she's, and she's been married before, so she'll miss having a husband, and so then they'll end up, she'll end up waxing wanton against Christ and will marry. So having damnation there in verse 12, because they have cast off their first faith. It doesn't say she's losing her salvation. Uh, casting off her first faith, it just simply means that by being taken care of by the church, she's obligated herself to spend her time doing things that she can for the church in exchange for the church taking care of her financially. And so it's sort of like she's entered into a contract with Christ to say, I am going to serve you, Christ, in this church doing what I can for the church in exchange for you taking care of me financially. And so if then she then goes get married to somebody, then what it's saying is she's having damnation, meaning not that, her, uh, that she loses her salvation, but her reward. She's basically broken that contract with Christ to take care of the church. So the damnation is the damnation or the loss of her reward. You know, just like we see at the judgment seat of Christ. They, uh, if you do the works of the flesh, they're burned up because they won't survive the fire. And so you suffer loss. Not loss of salvation, but loss of reward. So the damnation here is the damnation or the canceling out or the loss of the reward she would have received by serving Christ faithfully, having entered into this contract with the church that she will spend her time doing what she can for the church, and the church in return will take care of her financially. So the first faith there is, it's not her salvation, not you know, losing her salvation, or she didn't believe the gospel anymore. You can see from the context, it's just simply that she says, well, um, I made a mistake in saying I wanted to uh, be taken care of the, by the church. I instead would rather get married again. So the casting off the first faith is, casting off that first contract that she made with the church to take care of the church in exchange for the church taking care of her financially. And so then she has damnation or loss of the reward. And then verse 13 says another issue is uh, if they're under 60 and uh, they do, uh, don't even if they don't get married, uh, you know, what, what's the old saying? Um, something about the devil's, like idle time is the devil's playground or some, something to that effect that, uh, you know, if, if you've got a lot of time on your hands, uh, then you start thinking about the lust of the flesh and how you want to do those things. Uh, whereas if you're busy, you know, like me, for example, I go to work. Uh, I'm not sitting around all day thinking of, you know, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and pride of life. 
I'm at work looking at spreadsheets and, and account statements, you know, so it's not, uh, my mind doesn't have the chance to wander into the things of the flesh because I'm busy. So if, let's say this woman's being taken care of the church, by the church, there's probably going to be a lot of downtime. Again, it's not a huge church. It's not like a mega church like a Joel Osteen where you could have a full-time job, maybe opening the mail or uh, being typing up letters or something. You know, it, you're not going to have a lot to do with a small church. So, having idle time, it says in verse 13, they're going to give away to the lust of their flesh, wandering about from house to house, being idle, tattlers, busy bodies. And so instead of doing that, then they need to do their God-given role, which is to marry a husband and to have children. Um, not, not that every woman has to get married, but since she's already been married before, that's the role she's taken before. So now she needs to take that role again. Otherwise, she'll, number one, break her contract with Christ and get married to somebody else. Or number two, in the meantime, before she does that, she'll give over to the lust of the flesh. Is that, that's the issue here. And so then when it says, verse 15, some are already turned aside after Satan. Again, that doesn't mean that uh, it lost their salvation. It's just by following the lust of the flesh, by wandering about from house to house, being idle, tattlers, busybodies, by doing those things, they're doing the lust of the flesh. They're doing what Satan would want them to do rather than following uh, what Christ would have them to do. So, uh, verse 12 there, the damnation, it's important to understand that the damnation is uh, basically loss of reward, not loss of salvation. And then verse 15, the uh, turn to Satan means they're following flesh, following the flesh rather than walking in the Spirit. And again, you can see these things here. Doctrinally speaking, you don't see that the woman doesn't trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for her sin. You don't see her not reading her Bible. It's just she's doing things that would please her flesh. Getting married, breaking her contract with Christ, verse 11. Or uh, being an idle gossip, tattler's busybodies, verse 13. As opposed to getting in God's Word and doing the work of the ministry. So, um, that's where it's already turned aside after Satan is. Give you an example of that. It makes me think if you go to Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. Uh, you can see Peter here. You know, Peter was the one that Jesus chose to be the leader of the church once Jesus ascended to the Father. Uh, so he was, you know, good in that leadership quality there. But at the same time, he was also good at putting his foot in his mouth. And here in Matthew 16, you see both of those things taking place. Verse 15, Matthew 16, 15, Jesus asked the disciples, He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou. Okay, so Matthew 16, 17, Peter is called blessed. Jesus says, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Well, if the Father has revealed to Peter that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, then uh, Peter must be a saved person because um, the Father... He, Otherwise, if he's dead in his trespasses and sins, if he's not a believer, then the Father isn't going to reveal the things of, of God to him. He wouldn't really know thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He'd be like the Pharisees trying to crucify him. So we know from there that Simon is a saved man, and he is called blessed by Jesus. And so then verse 18, he says that Peter basically is going to be the leader once Jesus is gone. And... Um, and in verse 19, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So you already see not only is Peter the, going to be the leader of the little flock when you get to uh, Acts and the whole uh, Acts chapter 1 there, but uh, you see he's also uh, knows things from the Father. He has the ability 
to forgive sins or to retain sins. I mean, that shows you the great authority that Jesus Christ has given him. And then verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Verse 23, But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now wait a minute here. We just learned that Peter is going to be the leader of the little flock, that he is blessed by the Father, to learn that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that Peter has the ability even to retain sins or forgive sins. I mean, I can't do that. None of us here can do that. Peter's got this great authority, and yet, shortly thereafter, I don't know how it says, I don't know exactly when, but it was shortly thereafter, uh, Peter says something that he shouldn't have said. He tries to rebuke the Lord, saying, oh no, you're not going to die. And you see there that in verse 23, Jesus calls Peter Satan. Jesus calls Peter Satan. Not only that, he says, You are an offense unto me, because you savor not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So, that he's not saying that he lost his salvation, because he's still going to be the leader of the little flock. He's still going to... Um, you know, be able to retain or forgive sins. What it's saying here is basically Peter is just listening to his own flesh. It's, um, it's the religion, the religious system that he's been in that taught him that the Messiah would not die for their sins because they thought they were automatically in the kingdom by the very fact that they were physical Jews. So Peter's idea is, okay, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and what he's going to do is he's going to overthrow the Romans set up God's kingdom on earth, and then we're going to rule and reign with him for all eternity. That's what's in his mind because that's what religion has taught him. So now Jesus comes along and says, that's not really what's going to happen. Instead, I'm going to be killed and raised again the third day. Suffer many things, be killed and raised again the third day. So Peter doesn't listen to Jesus. He doesn't believe God's word on it. Instead, he believes religion. And so... Again, it had nothing to do with his salvation. I mean, he already confessed, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, he's already been following Jesus as his disciple for probably close to three years at this point. Um, and Jesus has already said, After I'm gone, you're going to be the leader of the little flock, and you can forgive sins or you can retain sins. Because the Holy Ghost is going to be in you, and you showing you if someone's really believed or not. And yet... When he gets into the flesh, it says, he, he rebukes him and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. So, um, obviously, Peter is not Satan. It's just he is listening to doctrines of devils. He is listening to religion over God's word. So, when 1 Timothy 5.15 says that some of these widows are already turned aside after Satan, it doesn't mean they've lost their salvation. It doesn't mean that they stopped believing the gospel. It's, it just means that they've decided to follow the lust of the flesh. All of us, at some point or another, turn aside after Satan. Now, we may not be actively pursuing things like that, uh, but we, at all time, you know, all of us at some time will decide to follow the flesh rather than walking in the Spirit. And so we sin, and when we do that, we're really listening to uh, doctrines of devils. We're deciding, I'm not going to let the word of Christ dwell in me richly and live by the faith of the Son of God in this moment, in this particular situation. Instead, I'm going to follow what I want to do. So when you do that, you've turned after Satan. It doesn't mean you lost your salvation. It just means you're not following God's word. You're not letting Christ live in you. Instead, you're following what Satan would want you to do, the lust of the flesh. So just because 1 Timothy 5.15 says some are already turned aside after Satan, uh, doesn't mean they lose their salvation. In the context, what it means is that there have been some widows, and probably primarily those under 60, who the church had already started taking care of, and now they're not going to meet up to their end of the bargain 
by helping out the church, and instead they're going uh, about from house to house, idle, tattlers, busybodies. So here the church is taking care of them. Okay, what did you do for me today? You know, did you did you clean the dishes? Did you wash the floors? Did you did you uh, you know what did you do to help out the church? Since we're giving you money, we're letting you stay here. What did you do to help out? Well, I went to so and so's house, and oh, you'll never believe what she told me. You know, and so. What it's saying is, well, you're not following Christ. You made a contract to serve Christ, and in exchange, the church would take care of you, and instead, you're following after the things of the world, so you're following after Satan. You know, it has nothing to do with salvation. It's just that you've cast off that first faith, meaning that contract that you made with the church, that you would do the things of the Lord in exchange for them taking care of you. So uh, that's a specific situation, and yet, you know, people just pull those verses out and uh, say, oh yeah, damnation, well then you must have lost your salvation. But that's not the case. Uh, our next verse, this is our last one, is uh, 2, Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12. 2 Timothy 2 verse 12, let me just draw a line here. 2 Timothy 2 verse 12. 2 Timothy 2 12 says, if we suffer... We shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Oh, right there. Lost your salvation. So they'll pull that verse out and say, Oh, well, if I deny him, I, he'll deny me. Well, a lot of that comes from that Matthew passage about how if you, uh, Jesus says that if you deny me, in fact, I, I think it's Matthew 10, I want to say 39. Uh, over there in Matthew 10, you can see... Jesus says that um, in verse 33, Matthew 10, so Matthew 10, 33. Matthew 10, 33, and remember what we talked about how if it's in Matthew, it could very well be a conditional salvation passage. They could lose their salvation from hell. And that's the case here. Matthew 10, 33, Whosoever shall deny me before men him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. So deny Jesus. And that means Jesus denies you. Before the Father. Meaning uh, salvation lost. Salvation from hell is lost. And that's exactly what that verse is teaching. Uh, but the context there is, um, is the last half of the tribulation period. Uh, you can see the next uh, verse, verse 34. Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a, a man's foe shall be they of his own household. Uh, so, and you find in verse 39, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. The context is in that last half of the tribulation period, the, uh, the Antichrist says you need to bow down to the image of the beast or else I'm going to cut your head off. They're going to be beheaded if they don't bow down to the image. And so that's what he's talking about when he says, I came not to send peace but a sword. It's that context. I mean, you come to Christmas story, Luke 2, you read that. It says, uh, angels sing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And so people say, peace on earth, Christmas. Jesus has come, peace on earth. And then you see right here in Matthew 10, 34, think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. You say, wait a minute. I thought Jesus coming and living a perfect life and dying for my sin brought peace with God. Yes, it did. Matthew 5, 1 says, therefore being, I'm sorry, Romans 5, 1 says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He did come to send peace. Eternal peace in a spiritual kingdom, in the kingdom, for us in heaven, for Israel, it's on earth. But in the context, in that last half of the tribulation period, if you don't bow down to that image and they catch you, then they're going to cut your head off. You're going to be killed. And your own family may turn you in. That's what he's talking about, the variance against the man, against the father, and the daughter, against her mother. And, and so what he's saying is that when it comes to that point, basically that is the eternal security program of the devil. 
that if you bow down to that image, Revelation 14, 9 through 11 says, you will have your place in the lake of fire. Uh, and so when he says, Matthew 10, 33, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father which is in heaven. The context is when it comes to the image of the beast. If you deny him at any other time, you don't lose your salvation. How do we know? Well, Peter, we already talked about Peter. When Jesus is arrested, Peter denied Jesus at least three times. I don't know that man. He even swore an oath at the end saying he did not know Jesus. I mean, he denied him before men. Not just once, but at least three times. But he didn't lose his salvation because this is referring to a specific denial that has to do with the image of the beast. If you bow down to the image, then you are pledging your eternal allegiance to Satan. And so then you've denied Christ before men and you will have your place in the lake of fire. Then you will be denied before your Father which is in heaven. So uh, since most of churchianity takes the red letters over what Paul says, they would be more familiar with this passage in Matthew 10 than they would the 2 Timothy 2. So when you read 2 Timothy 2.12, uh, if we deny him, he also will deny us, then they automatically think back to Matthew 10 and think, oh, well, I'll lose my salvation then. So it's a conditional salvation passage. But uh, that's really referring to denying uh, deny Jesus equals not loss of salvation, but again, loss of reward. And that's very easy to see because we'll just read the verses around it. Verse 11 is an eternal security passage, and verse 13 is an eternal security passage. But the people who want to teach conditional salvation, the guy who gave me 68 verses on the internet that shows that Paul teaches uh, you can lose your salvation, he quoted verse 12. He didn't mention verses 11 and 13. If you just pull verse 12 out and you know what Matthew 10 says, you think, oh yeah, I could lose my salvation. But you can't pull a verse out of context to understand it. Verse 11, 2 Timothy 2, 11, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Well, we are dead with him. Look in Colossians. Look in Colossians chapter 3. Look in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, verse 3. Colossians 3, verse 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And in verse 4 says, Christ is our life. So how did I get to the point where I'm dead, and Christ is my life? Well, I was taken out of Adam, I was placed into Christ. And that took place the moment that I believed the gospel. You go back to chapter before, Colossians 2. Colossians 2, verse 10 says, Colossians 2.10 says, Ye are complete in Him. We've got that up here. Ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. So I'm complete in Christ. Why? Verse 11, I've received spiritual circumcision. Verse 12, I've received spiritual baptism. Verse 13 says, I was dead in sins and the uncircumcision of my flesh, but now God has quickened us together with Christ, having forgiven you all trespasses. So what that tells you, and that's what we're going to get into when we get into Romans 6 next week, is that the moment you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, you're taken out of Adam, you're placed into Christ. So then, Colossians 3.3 3 applies. Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So when you go back to 2 Timothy 2.11, it says, so 2 Timothy 2.11, the verse right before verse 12, says, uh, dead with Christ equals life with Christ. And we'll get into that next week over there in Romans 6. If we're identified with Jesus' death the moment that we believe the gospel, it says we're also identified with his resurrection life. So when it says in verse 11, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. That's an eternal security passage. The moment that you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, you're taken out of Adam, you're placed into Christ. By being placed into Christ, you're dead with him, baptized into his death. If you're identified with his death, you're also identified with his resurrection. So since you're dead with him, you also will live with him. 
Verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And that's why it's loss of reward. Denying Jesus there doesn't mean that I do like Peter does. But it means I deny him the opportunity to live through me right now. If I let Christ live in me, I'm going to suffer. The next chapter tells me that. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 says... Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. My flesh is going to persecute me because my flesh doesn't want to walk in the Spirit. The world is going to persecute me because they're following the course of the world. And the, most, the biggest persecution from the world is going to be from the Christian religion. That's what Paul had his persecution was from the prevailing religion at that day, which was, the, was Judaism, because he's preaching God's word, and Judaism takes God's word, and they twist it to meet their traditions. So when you, when you follow God and his word, your flesh is going to persecute you, the world is going to persecute you, and especially religious Christians are going to persecute you, because you're, you're blowing their cover. Religious uh, Christians, 2 Timothy 3, 5, it tells you, 2 Timothy 3, 5, that they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The power of godliness is the word of God. Hebrews 4, 12 says, the word of God is quick and powerful. So if they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, what that means is they're using scripture, or they're taking on Jesus' name, or they're saying they're serving God, but they deny the power of the verses. They may use scripture, but they take them out of context. They don't let the power of the word of God work in their lives. And so when you do that, when you believe God's word in its context, live by the faith of the Son of God, then they're going to be the ones who persecute you. I mean, you know, atheists may think you're crazy for following the Bible, but they're not going to persecute you. I mean, you're not doing anything against them. You know, they're going to leave you alone unless you're like, like Kent Hovind and doing a debate against evolution, you know, that type of thing. But if you're just, you're just letting Christ live in you in your normal life, atheists may think you're crazy, but they're not going to persecute you. They just leave you alone. You're not harming them. But you're harming religious Christians when you let Christ live in you because you're using verses and the power of Christ is coming through you. Christ is living in you. They're using verses, but they're denying the power of Christ in them. And so you're making them look bad. So they're going to persecute you. So that's why verse 12 says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. So if we suffer as a result of godly living, then we'll get a position in heavenly places. But if we deny him, in the context, it is denying him living through us, denying us suffering as a result of the, of the doctrine, he also will deny us. Where does he deny us? A position in heavenly places. We end up being a name, um, every name that is named, rather than a, a throne, a principality, a power, a might, or a dominion. Then you go down to verse 13, and here's the worst scenario of all. I mean, when you see the, today, the unpardonable sin for today, and really any dispensation, is unbelief. If you never believe the gospel, you are guaranteed to go to hell. That's the only sin the sin of unbelief that is not forgiven by the blood of Christ because, because you've got to believe in order for the blood of Christ to apply to you. So if you don't believe the gospel, you basically committed the unpardonable sin for today. It's unbelief. But here's somebody who's already believed the gospel and we've seen that from Romans 5 that we have now been justified by his blood. We have now received the atonement. We're already eternally secure. So this is a person who is has believed the gospel, trusted in Jesus' death, burial and resurrection as atonement for their sin, and for whatever reason they say, I was an idiot when I did that, that was stupid, I don't believe that anymore, I'm now an atheist, okay? It says, if we believe not, verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. So, here I am, stop believing the gospel, I believed it once, but then I stopped believing it but yet I still get eternal life. Why? Because he cannot deny himself. The moment that I trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin, 
I was taken out of Adam and I was placed into Christ. Now I am baptized into his death, verse 11, so then I shall live with him. I mean, that's a done deal. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. I've received regeneration. I've got forgiveness of sins. It's a done deal. You can't be unforgiven. So since I am in Christ, the only way after I have believed the gospel and been placed into Christ, the only way I can go to hell is if Christ goes to hell. And since the justice of God says that Christ cannot go to hell because he was perfect, he was righteous, the wages of sin is death and Christ did no sin, therefore he did not earn um, hell. Therefore, uh, to send Christ to an eternal lake of fire would be unjust. So because God cannot deny himself, Christ, from having eternal life and you are in Christ, then you cannot be denied eternal life even if you decide after you believe the gospel not to believe the gospel anymore. So, so you've got here 2 Timothy 2.11 says, since you're dead with Christ, since you believe the gospel, you're going to live with Christ. Um, if you stop believing, if you stop believing, you still have eternal life because God cannot deny Christ eternal life. That would be unjust. So you've got verse 11, because you believe the gospel, you're dead with Christ, therefore you have life with him. And verse 13, even if you stop believing, you still have eternal life. And now the conditional salvation guy throws verse 12 in and says, oh, you see right there, you can lose your salvation if we deny him. No, no, it's not talking about that. You learn eternal security in verse 11. You learn eternal security in verse 13. Verse 12 is if we suffer, we shall reign with him. So it's talking about a position in heavenly places. It's not talking about losing your salvation. Uh, that one is, is pretty clear. But, uh, but the problem is, you can't, if you don't read verses 11 and verse 13, um, you can be convinced that you can lose your salvation. If you just read verse 12. That's why it's always, that's why I don't like the trend of these like Lana and I went to this mega church down the road because they opened up a satellite campus down here just to see what it was like, you know. And uh, I'm there taking notes on what, you know, all the doctrinal errors and the message, you know, and all that. But, you know, what he's doing is, first off, he's not using a King James Bible. And nobody there has a Bible. I don't even think the pastor up there had it. They got this big screen on the wall and they just stick a verse up there. And so then he talks about that verse. And that's why, that's why you always need to bring your Bible and read it for yourself. Because anybody can just take a verse out and, re and read it and then just come up with their own interpretation. So you could do that in a megachurch. You could, put, you could have your overhead. You could put 2 Timothy 2.12 on there. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. You put that on there and, uh, and then you talk about how you can lose your salvation. And if you don't have a Bible to read verse 11 and verse 13, then you'll believe you can lose your salvation based on that verse. But you gotta, you got to read context to figure out, you know what, just pull a verse out. I mean, you know, I pull verses out, I gave you verses, but I try to, when I go to those, I tell you first, you turn to them, and then we look at the context, the verses before and after. And if I don't have time to do that or whatever, you should at least write the references down that we're talking about, and after we're done, go, go after it on your, on your own. The Bereans were considered more noble than the Thessalonians because they didn't just take Paul's word for it. They searched the scriptures to see if what he said is so. I am not your authority. God's word is your authority. And so I could take a verse out of context, say something that it doesn't really say. Um, I don't do that, at least not intentionally. I've never done that. Um, but you, you never know. You know, maybe I change my agenda. You don't know. So you always need to take the Bible as your authority, not man. And write down these ver references. Read them uh, later and figure out if I'm right or not. And, you know, if, if it doesn't say what I'm saying that it says, send me an email. Let me know. Maybe I need to learn something, you know. We, we can all learn together. So hopefully that concludes our, uh, our conditional salvation passages in Paul's epistles. We've got a little time left over, and just as a introduction, um, 
in Romans 6, we're going to be talking about how we are baptized into Christ. And um, we don't have a lot of time to go through this uh, again tonight, which is okay because we'll go in detail when we get to Romans 6. But I thought since we do have a little bit of time here, um, let me just write down on the board here. And this is just, um, this isn't everything. This is who we are in Christ. We read Colossians 2.10, you're complete in Him, you're complete in Christ. Uh, what does that mean, complete in Christ? From uh, Colossians 2.10. Colossians 2.10. Uh, I've got a list here of a bunch of things. What, um, about 20 things here. Uh, we don't have time for, for the 20. But here are the main five. Uh, and, and it's easier to remember. If you, if you look at the acronym CRIBS, C-R-I-B-S, uh, that's five main things that you have when you believe the gospel. The moment that you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. Uh, the five things are, the C of cribs is circumcision. And by the way, we'll be going through these things when we get to Romans 6. So this is sort of like an introduction for next week. Um, but I just want to give this to you so you have an idea of where we're going. R is a regeneration. Regeneration. And I'll give you some scripture verses here. I is the indwelling Holy Ghost. Indwelling Holy Ghost. B is uh, baptized into Christ. You're baptized into Christ. And uh, S is sealed. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and there are other things. I've got on this list, I'll just read the other ones to you. Uh, we receive God's righteousness. We're established in the faith. We're part of the new creature. We have redemption. We're reconciled to God. We have peace with God. We have eternal life. We're a child of God. We're justified and glorified. We are one in Christ. We are crucified with Christ. We, are, we have liberty. We're joint heirs with Christ. And we are called to a heavenly place. Those are the main things. Um, I've got references for all of these, so what we'll do, since we're going to go into Romans 6 next Tuesday, what I'll do is when I send out the email for next Tuesday, I'll include this list here, so you have this complete list and all these references, and uh, I don't think this is a complete list. These are just the main ones that I picked up on. Uh, you could probably study it out and find some more in Paul's epistles. Uh, but the main five, with the little bit of time we have left today, the main five here... Uh, circumcision, uh, Colossians 2, verse 11. Colossians 2, 11. And if we go there, we can see that the circumcision there is a spiritual circumcision. Now, a lot of times churches don't want to talk about circumcision because people think of the physical and, you know, you don't really want to... You know, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to see it. <laughs> but uh, what it's a good thing if it's spiritual. Uh, the, the physical was just a sign of what God wanted to do spiritually uh, to them. So Colossians 2.11, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That tells you spiritual circumcision if it's made without hands. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So what that does is the spiritual circumcision is uh, sins put off or... I should probably say cut off, because that's what circumcision is. It's a cutting. Sins cut off from your soul. That right there is the reason you have eternal security. Because after you're saved, you will sin again, unless you uh, die three seconds later, you know. <laughs> uh, you will sin again. And so the sin, though, the reason you have eternal security is because the body, the sins of the flesh, have been cut off from the soul. So when you sin, the sin still resides in the flesh and it never reaches your soul. So that right there, the circumcision, and that's important to understand because it is, uh, it's where your eternal security is. So what churches do is, because they're walking by sight, they don't, and they don't want to talk about the physical one, instead they put the focus on water baptism and they don't teach. But you won't find a denomination that teaches spiritual circumcision. Or if they do, they rarely talk about it because um, that's where your eternal security is. And they don't, 
want to teach that. They want to teach work so they can get you to keep coming back to their church. Uh, next thing, regeneration. Uh, Titus 3, 5 is the reference there. Titus 3, 5. A lot of times there's that term out there where people will say, I'm born again when I'm saved. That's really a term for Israel. I mean, I don't, I don't go about trying to correct somebody if they, you know, if they use that term. If they want to know, I can give them verses to show them that you're a new creature in Christ. You're not born again. But um, I think the closest thing we have to being born again is this uh, regeneration here. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Uh, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It basically means that here you are dead in your trespasses and sins, and God regenerated you. It's like He gave you a new life. That's why I say it's close to born again. But you're not born again. What you're done is you, what happens is you're placed into Christ, so you're part of the new creature. You're part of the body of Christ. So, in order to do that, though, because Christ is holy, then you've got to be regenerated. Colossians 3.12 says uh, that you are holy and beloved. So that goes along with it. So the regeneration is now you're holy because you're in Christ and you're part of that new creature. So that's uh, regeneration. Again, we're just going to go over these quickly tonight, give you a, sort of an introduction to next Tuesday. Uh, the next one, indwelling Holy Ghost. Uh, two references for that, uh, Romans 5.5 5 and 1 Thessalonians 4.8. Those are verses that tell you that the Holy Ghost has been given to you. Um, but what I want to do instead of reading those verses, I mean, you got them there, so you can, Romans 5.5, 5, 1 Thessalonians 4.8 are proof texts that show you that you've got the indwelling Holy Ghost the moment you believe the gospel. You don't have to speak in tongues or move in the Spirit like the Pentecostals would have you do. Uh, the moment you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, the Holy Ghost is given to you. And His job, and that's what I wanted to go to now, is first, uh, 1 Corinthians 2. Because God's will, 1 Timothy 2, 4 says, God's will is for all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. So the moment you've been saved, now the next step is come into the knowledge of the truth. And that's where the Holy Ghost comes in. So uh, in 1 Corinthians 2, you can see that um, when it comes to the things of God, in verse 9, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Verse 12, We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So the Holy Ghost's job is to teach you the Word or the things of God, which is the same thing. Um, that's why I wanted to go to that because in a, in a church background, especially a church I grew up in, Pentecostal, and dwelling Holy Ghost immediately says, oh, I speak in tongues, or, um, you know, I move in the Holy Ghost. The, the Bible college that I went to, the class that I was expelled from, the book of Acts, they wanted you to pray. They believed in a, it was sort of a, a Pentecostal type thing, although they didn't claim to be Pentecostal. They believed in a second outpouring of the Holy Ghost. So you got the initial indwelling of the Holy Ghost the moment you believed the gospel. But if you wanted the power to serve the Lord, which may include speaking in tongues, which they believe, if you want the power to serve the Lord, you had to pray to receive a second blessing of the Holy Ghost upon you. Um, the church I grew up in, they believed you were filled with the Holy Ghost once you spoke in tongues. So very similar there. I don't think they called it a second filling, but it was a very similar idea there. That, And so a lot of times in churches, when you're told you've got the indwelling Holy Ghost, 
people automatically think, oh, speaking in tongues. So that's why I wanted to go to 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 13. So the Holy Ghost is given to you not for you to feel good, although you can feel good when you read God's Word, you know, uh, but it is, uh, His job is to teach you the Word as you read it. That's why you've been given the indwelling Holy Ghost, to teach you God's Word, so you can come into the knowledge of the truth. Okay, the next one is uh, baptized into Christ, and that's what we're going to talk about um, next Tuesday. The main passages there are Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, and uh, Colossians 2, 12. And uh, let's look at the Colossians 2 passage, since we'll look at Romans next week. We'll look at the Romans 6 passage. And, um, and just like people think of, it's interesting, everything, it seems like churchianity is geared toward the physical. We're supposed to be walking by faith, but they look at it in terms of walking by sight, because it's... If I mention circumcision, they immediately think of physical circumcision. They don't think of spiritual circumcision. Most people who've been in church all their lives don't even know spiritual circumcision exists. They just know about the physical. And if I talk about indwelling Holy Ghost, they're thinking of a physical manifestation of speaking in tongues or moving, you know, uncontrollable shaking. And if you think about baptism, they're thinking about water baptism. But the baptized into Christ, which we'll go into next week, is, um, is a spirit, spiritual baptism. And that's why I wanted to look at the Colossians 2 passage. So Colossians 2 verse 10 says, Colossians 2 10, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Uh, it doesn't stop there. It gives you a definite, it gives a colon. So uh, what comes in verse 11 is a definition of how you're complete in him. How am I complete in Christ? Well, first off, Verse 11, and that was our first one, circumcision, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Okay, what's the circumcision of Christ? Again, you got a colon there. So now verse 12 is going to define verse 11. And ver verse 12 says, buried with him in baptism. If it's water, it would say, dunked with him in baptism or sprinkled with him in baptism depending on how you do it. But it says buried with him in baptism. We only refer to burials. When we say bury, that means death is what it means. And that's what we'll see next time in Romans 6. That the baptism that we're identified with Christ is we're baptized into his death. Romans 6, 3 and 4 says. You're baptized into his death. So we are buried with him in baptism wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. That goes back to our 2 Timothy 2.11 passage. If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Why? Because we've been identified with Christ's death, so we're also going to be identified with his resurrection. And that's why, and then there's a period at the end of verse 12. So that, those three verses there tell you how you're complete in him. I'm complete in him because, verse 11, if I sin after I'm saved, the sin never reaches my soul because the sins of the body, the sins of the flesh, have been cut off from my soul. So the sin still resides in my soul, in my, in my flesh. I'm sorry, the sin still resides in my flesh. And that vile flesh, when I die, stays in the grave. And when I get new flesh, will be at the rapture, and that's glorified flesh. And Philippians 3.21 tells you about how the working whereby Christ is able to subdue all things unto himself. He's able to take that vile flesh and get rid of all the sins that were attached to it and purify it and give me glorified flesh. Um, so, verse 11 says, so I'm complete in him how? Verse 11, if I sin after I'm saved, it never reaches my soul. And then verse 12, the reason I'm complete in him is because when Jesus died, I was identified with his death by baptism, buried with him in baptism. So I'm identified into Christ's death. So that means also I'm identified with his resurrection. So the way I'm complete in Christ is verse 11, any sins I do after I'm saved don't count against me because they never reach my soul. And verse 12, Christ's life is what counts for me 
because I'm identified with Christ and his death, therefore I'm identified with his life. That's how I'm complete in him. My sins are not counted against me, past, present, future. Christ's life is counted for me because I'm hid in Christ. So um, that's baptized in, into Christ. And that's a whole lot better than being dunked or sprinkled with water. Because, you know, if you're dunked or sprinkled with water, um, anybody could do that. Let's say that I meet a, a cute girl at college and I decide, and she invites me to her church. I say, ah, I'll go to that church. Doesn't mean I believe God in the Bible. So I want to date that girl. So then I go to, I, I remember seeing that, that there's a girl at the, the church I went to. It, she'd show up with these, she'd go out witnessing on a Friday night. She'd show up with some guy she'd never seen before. Uh, you know, they, they'd always go with her. If I did that, they're not going to, you know, it's going to go with me. But she was a cute girl, so they, they had these guy, uh, guys coming with her. You wouldn't see him again after the first time because they figured out she's not, they're not going to get anywhere with her. Um, but, you know, let's say you're really smitten by her. Maybe the guy goes ahead and uh, shows that he's serious by getting water baptized. That doesn't really show he's saved. That's just a show in the flesh to convince the girl to go out with him. That's all that is, you know. Not saying that every, I mean, most people who get water baptized are sincere. I'm not trying to diminish that. But I'm making the point that water baptism doesn't mean that you're saved. It's not this baptized into Christ isn't water baptism. Baptized into Christ is something that the Holy Spirit does. And he cuts off the body of the sins of the flesh and you're identified with his life, which... I'm getting too much into Romans 6 for next week, so let's keep going. Seal with the Holy Spirit is the next one. <laughs> and uh, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, and uh, chapter 4, verse 30. So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And uh, if, if you don't get all of these, um, like I said, next Tuesday when I send out the notes, um, I'll send out... Those, and this is just the first five. I had a, a whole bunch more on this list. So I'll send that out with, with the references as well. So you'll have that. Uh, but I did want to at least get you an introduction here. So Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So we're still with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 13. Ephesians 1, 13. In whom, that's in Christ, ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believe, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest or down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So the seal of the Holy Spirit means that you've got that salvation. It's secure. There's nothing that can happen to it. You know, I uh, uh, just the other day, Lana had this thing of wipes, you know, alcohol wipes, and you try to clean surfaces and things, and she hit them all in this container. And uh, I just I just found it uh, this last week. So it had been there about two years. So it's this container, and it has all these, it had at least 100 wipes in there, big container, 100 wipes. And I, oh, well, okay. So I open it up, all the wipes are there. They're completely dry. Why? Well, because they've been out for two years, and I, evidently they weren't sealed. So the, there wasn't a seal, there was air that got in and, and all the chemicals that were in the wipes had evaporated over a two-year period of time. It, at least two years. I don't know how long she had it, but at least two years it had been sitting there. And so without the seal, you know, the seal locks in the freshness. It keeps the, the chemicals there. Um, but without it being sealed, it all dried up. So, um, but here, you see, if you've got salvation and then you've got the seal of the Holy Spirit of promise, well, that locks it in. You know, no one is going to be... Because you know Satan, he, he goes against the saints. He'd do anything he could to steal your salvation. You know, in the book of Jude, it says that Satan disputed with Michael over the bones of Moses. So you know Satan, he's the accuser of the brethren. Job, Jesus, uh, God says, look at my servant Job. Satan says, ah, no, nah, if I send him some troubles, he'll, he'll deny you. Satan's always... You know Satan's accusing us to Jesus. Oh yeah, that Eric. Yeah, sure he says he believed the gospel, but you're not really going to give him heaven, are you? I mean, look at all the bad thoughts he has, the sinful desires 
of his, of his flesh there. He doesn't deserve heaven. Well, if I've got the seal of the Holy Spirit, that locks it in. I'm not ever going to lose my salvation. It's not going to... It's not going to leak out through the air like those wipes did sitting there for two years. The Holy Spirit seals it to where our salvation is preserved. It's perfect. It's not going to, we're not going to lose part of it. Satan can't attack it and try to steal at least part of it or so. It's, we're sealed with that Holy Spirit of the promise, a Holy Spirit of promise, and the Holy Spirit within us is the earnest or down payment of our inheritance. It's showing that you've, You've got an inheritance in Christ. Um, and so you've got that down payment of it, the Holy Spirit. That's part of your inheritance. So these are, again, I said I've got a longer list, but these are the main things here, these five. We're complete in Christ. So we've got spiritual circumcision. So that means we're eternally secure. We've been regenerated, which means we don't have that old filthy rags righteousness anymore, but we are part of that new creature of Christ, washed in regeneration and dwell in Holy Ghost. And He's going to be there to teach us the things of God so we can come into the knowledge of the truth and live by the faith of the Son of God. We are baptized into Christ, which means we are identified with His death, so we are also identified with His resurrection. So we already have eternal life, and we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, so that locks that salvation in. You can't have any contamination of it. Uh, you know, it won't get worse over time. You know how things are. Uh, those wipes... Uh, they were good when she bought them. I'm sure they had all the, the things on them, but because there was no seal, they all dried out. That won't happen to our salvation. Our salvation is just as secure 50 years from now as the, as from the first time we believe. 50 years from the first time we believe it's just as secure because it's been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And He's that down payment or the earnest of our inheritance so we can have confidence and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Christ is our hope, knowing we have that confident expectation of eternal life and a reward in heaven. So uh, next week, we'll get into the baptized part, Romans 6. So uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for being complete in Christ. We thank you that we cannot lose our salvation. Not that we'd want to sin more, although our flesh does, but so that Christ can, can live in us. Help us, Lord, to read your word, believe it, let the Holy Ghost teach it to us, Use the mind of Christ and live by the faith of the Son of God so that we will be well-pleasing to you, being good ambassadors for Christ, bringing you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.